we have now discussed, first of all, the age to start, the interval. There seems to be consensus not to start with HPV screening too early. Now we are ready to discuss guidelines and perspectives on guidelines in the United States. And this will be now presented by Walter Kinney, followed by Jack Cusick, who will present the European perspective. I was asked to talk about screening strategies for women aged 30 years and older. I work uh, for Kaiser Permanente Northern California. I don't have any conflicts of interest with anyone. Um, I'd like to start by recognizing two of my uncompensated female colleagues. Helen Dinkelspiel is responsible for a lot of what I'm going to show you. And Barbara Fetterman is the data guru at the regional lab without whom none of this would have taken place. My personal recommendation for optimal screening of women age 30 and older is any scheme that you can actually get implemented that includes HPV screening. It's a little like working on some repair project at home. The best tool for the job is the one you can actually find. Longer intervals equals more cancer in the screened population. The jury is out about the magnitude of the change in cancer as intervals change. And societal risk tolerance and resources will drive local decision making. Effective triage of HPV positive women is essential for all of the schemes. Um, the very best part about coming to meetings like this is I get to listen to the experts talk and, and learn from them. And the very worst part about coming to meetings like this is I need to take a beating every time I come for the fact that we're still doing cytology. So I'm going to spend a little time trying to explain why that is or was, perhaps still is, essential for us to have been able to have instituted a screening program that includes HPV for every woman 30 and above 10 years ago. To um, change an entrenched system, the people that need to perceive benefit or at least lack of injury include the doctors who can't see their incomes go down and they don't want their patients harmed. The patients who will not permit denial of care, removal of um, privileges they have enjoyed previously or increased cancer risk, the laboratorians who are not willing to see their incomes go down, the regulatory personnel, the guideline writers, the medical legal personnel, the quality assurance evaluators, and the payers. All of these groups have to be satisfied if you're actually going to change something. None of this has to do with randomized controlled clinical trials. What I'm telling you about is what actually has to happen to change large systems. So why are we still doing cytology? The patients are not willing to consider takeaways. They very simply won't do it. Um, there is some admittedly small change in sensitivity. It is not more expensive for us. It is actually cheaper because we self-insure. Every woman who has cancer subsequent to screening is a potential multi-million dollar judgment, and we pay those every year. I can do a lot of pap smears for $2 million in a, a medical legal judgment. Um, there are no American guidelines uh, for primary HPV screening only. The legal standards are something called community standard of practice, which is the idea that if you are doing something different than the other doctors in your community and someone has a bad outcome, you are liable. There's something called HEDIS, the Healthcare Employer Data Information Set. And it is the primary quality measure by which we are judged. And that measure is how frequently someone has had a pap smear, not when they've had an HPV test. That doesn't count in measuring the quality of a health plan by which it is determined how much we get paid per member per month. And finally, abandoning cytology doesn't help the real problem, which is what to do with the PAP negative HPV positive women. And you still have that problem if you start doing primary HPV screening with cytology triage. We know that the patients won't accept takeaways because we tried it. We recommended two year screening instead of one year screening. and Several years later, the patients still weren't doing it, and the doctors weren't recommending it to them. You can see the little bump on the right, which is the folks that were doing two-year screening. 
and you can see that most people were still doing annual screening because they recognized that this was a takeaway and they recognized that this was going to provide more cancer risk. The reason that they accepted co-testing was that we were telling them that they could have no decrement uh, in their cancer protection and come to the doctor fewer times. And that was an acceptable message, both for the doctors and for the physicians. And they actually did the interval recommendations, amazingly. This is the first quarter million women that had a negative co-test between 2003 and 2005 and when they came back. This was a sea change at this time in the United States. Sensitivity. Um, in fact, there are cancers that are PAP positive, HPV test negative, and as is visible on the right-hand column of these 136 women who were co-tested in the 6 to 42 months prior to diagnosis, uh, 11 of the 96 people who had a positive co-test were PAP positive HPV test negative. So the, the increment in sensitivity is admittedly small, but it's not zero. Here is the same information from Kotke et al. The blue line here is risk of cancer in the PAP positive HPV test negative population. And that blue line is not at the zero. Okay. Guidelines. We simply don't have guidelines presently for primary HPV screening. Um, as you have been shown, the guidelines uh, are all for co-testing. They're not for primary HPV screening. Um, I, I discussed what uh, community standard of practice means uh, and what HEDIS is about and the issue about abandoning cytology. I would also point out that PAP negative HPV positive is a huge deal if you think that you want to be using HPV screening because currently the only plans for implementation that I am aware of that don't involve co-testing involve using cytology as the secondary triage modality and then you're right back where you started trying to figure out what the, to do with the PAP negative HPV positives. Um, Dr. Castle has demonstrated in our Portland cohort that half of the cancer that was eventually diagnosed uh, in that 18-year uh, follow-up period was in the PAP-negative HPV positive group. And this is seen again in Kotke's work. This line is the PAP-negative HPV positive cancer risk over five years in 330,000 women. And that's a problem that is not fixed by changing to HPV primary screening at this point in time before there is triage. So if you really want to change the practice of a large number of people in a short period of time, you have to do it in a way that all of the different participants are comfortable with. And as a consequence, you may be doing things that you wouldn't normally do if all you were doing was relying on randomized controlled clinical trials to tell you what to do. And sometimes you may do some things that look pretty outlandish from the outside to accomplish your goal. The very best scheme for screening women age 30 and older is the one that you can actually implement that includes HPV. Like I said, sometimes you have to do things that don't seem reasonable to the people from who are looking at them from the outside. But if, in fact, you want to cut the hedge and you don't have a ladder, you get in the goddamn tractor and you get up there and you do what needs to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Walter. So Americans go for co testing. I think that uh, Jack will tell us that Europeans will go for just HPV testing. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, well, I, uh, the, the title was to talk about uh, screening over the age of 30, a European perspective. Well, the first thing to say is that Europe, for age 30, has nothing to do with European screening whatsoever. I mean, there's enormous amount of variation across countries, and this fact that things might be different at age 30 really is not yet um, uh, permeated into the system. I thought I'd say just a little bit about, I mean, this is basically Ronco's paper from a couple of years ago, just looking at 
the, the, different, the different countries. And, and just to emphasize the fact that Europe is a place with many, many systems. Every country has its own system in terms of screening. Uh, the starting age, as we've seen, varies anywhere from 15 to 30. The screening interval uh, varies anywhere from one year to five years. Um, the management of, of, of low-grade abnormalities is completely different. There's enormous variation across Europe. So uh, although Marx made a great effort, I think, in beginning to pull together European guidelines, the fact of the matter is, is that the actually implementation on the ground is still highly variable. And uh, this uh, also wanted to emphasize the fact that, in fact, uh, again, as Mark and others have pointed out, the crucial thing in any kind of screening program is to have some kind of organized screening programs. And this uh, slide uh, simply highlights the fact that, in fact, still in most of Europe, we do not have organized screening programs. We have guidelines for different countries, but with the exception of the UK, uh, Scandinavia and one or two other places, nationwide population-based organized programs do not exist. They exist in regions in different parts of the, in different countries, notably in Italy now and in Spain. But much of Europe is still a guideline, but a local local uh, policy. There's no routine scre implemented implement, uh, screening programs in which there is any kind of central coordination or evaluation. Um, in, in the 2010 guidelines, we've actually got some way more towards actually getting evidence for essentially using HPV in terms of uh, second, well, not primary screening, but in other places. And there's now in this published guideline the fact that HPV testing is recognized as being better in the triage of low-grade cytology. And I'll show you a little bit about the fact that that now has been widely implemented in terms of guidelines across the country, and also in terms of the sort of test of cure or looking at uh, the follow-up of patients treated for high-grade lesions. Um, just to look at the, some of these things, the recommendations are really quite different in all of the different countries, but again, uh, are beginning now to follow uh, those particular guidelines. The Germans now indicate or do, do recommend HPV testing for, uh, for low-grade minimal abnormalities and after treatment. But again, there's nothing for primary screening recommended routinely. The French system, this is uh, Dr. Montenegro has actually given, us, uh, given me this. It's, a, it's a, again somewhat complicated, but it's really quite similar in the sense that ASCUS uh, does get, uh, can get HPV testing or repeat cytology. Again, this is typical many places. A similar sort of uh, situation in Spain, uh, the guidelines basically support HPV testing for, for the triage of ASCUS, uh, but there's no guidelines uh, in terms of primary screening. Uh, Swedish guidelines, again, are very, very similar. Um, in the UK, um, basically, um, we have a situation in which pilot studies have actually been done to, to, to look at borderline and mild. Those have been completed. There now is a government recommendation that we should introduce HPV triage for borderline and ASCUS, that is essentially LCIL and, and, and um, well, uh, ASCUS, uh, borderline and mild smears, ASCUS and, and LCIL, um, with immediate referral if you're HPV positive. That's been done in six sentinel sites, recommended some time ago to be introduced nationally. That has actually been held up because, in fact, they haven't provided any money or support to actually set up the initial investment. So that's happening very, very slowly, although there is a national guideline that this should be part of the screening program. It is not certainly happening routinely. And uh, this is the protocol. Again, I won't go through all the details, but it's similar to the other ones. There is a clear protocol for how that should be done. Primary screening in Europe is still uh, at a, it's still in a little bit of, uh, well, very much in a, a, a set of flux. Many, many trials have been done. We, uh, I think m most of the big screening, or many of the big screening trials have been done in, in Europe. Many uh, pilot projects are now being completed everywhere. But by and large, with the one or two exception, it is not happening routinely anywhere, um, although we're 
hoping, and we continue to hope almost on a daily basis that that will change, uh, there are not routine large-scale primary HPV testing programs ongoing. Uh, one of the big differences, I think, between Europe and North America is that there's little interest in co-testing in Europe. Um, most people accept that there's little, be obtained, little to be gained by using both tests. The Dillner paper did, uh, has shown that. That's been confirmed in many, many other studies that cytology does not detect virtue, or there's very little that cytology detects that isn't already HPV positive. And although Walter makes the good point that, in fact, typically you use cytology to triage HPV, so you still have the question of what you do with HPV positive, cytology negative, one of the advantages, in fact, the major advantages of, of avoiding co-testing is you don't end up with women who've got ASCUS or LSIL who are HPV negative. And in fact, co-testing uh, ends up producing, putting those women into some kind of surveillance and additional follow-up system. If you just test first for HPV, you do not identify women who've got ASCUS, which is HPV negative, which carries an extremely low risk of disease. And that's probably the single biggest advantage of co-testing, is aside from avoiding all of the extra cytology, you do avoid referral and follow-up of women who've got HPV negative, low-grade cytology. There's also interest in, in Europe, um, particularly the Dutch have done a lot, but we're also doing quite a bit in, in England, looking at the role of self-sampling. And I think this is something that will, uh, although it's still early stages, it's beginning to be recognized that uh, there is a proportion of women who do not come for screening, and a self-sample provides really substantial protection in those groups. So the algorithm that I guess myself and colleagues proposed some time ago is kind of the basis of which many European countries are thinking. Basically, um, the age at which you should start screening probably is 25 in general, but I think there is a recognition that we do not know clearly how to manage HPV positive women between the ages of 25 and 30. So certainly for women over 30, you just need to do an HPV test. If that's negative, the protection really lasts for at least five years. And many places I think are prepared even after a couple of negatives to consider even longer recall. And only those that are HPV positive need any kind of triage. And at the moment, most places are going for cytology triage. If that's normal or low grade, repeat is the typical kind of example, and only the higher grades would go to colposcopy. This is our old scheme. And then further follow up, in a, if, if at the repeat everything's gone negative, both HPV and cytology, uh, that was a transient infection and can be safely returned to, uh, to a normal recall at five years. The UK now is just beginning to develop their pilot program for primary screening. And at the moment, uh, it looks like they're going to actually, we start screening in England from age 25. The plan is to actually introduce primary HPV alone testing from the age of 25. Um, and then again, use cytology triage with the view that HPV positive, cytology negative can actually go, can actually get a repeat testing probably at one year, although again, there's a little bit of argument as to whether that should be one year or two years. So we're beginning to see movement in many, many places. Uh, I don't have time to go through. The Dutch have a similar kind of plan. The, the, the Swedes are, are some way along on this. So many places are actually trying to do this. There's also a large Italian study, uh, which may be, I guess you could almost consider this the first full-scale implementation, is that demonstration projects really in large numbers are now being done in a number of areas. In, in Italy, and this is uh, the one more from, from, from Lazio, the middle of the country. Uh, again, uh, movement is taking place. It's still in kind of large-scale demonstration projects. Uh, we do not have a European guideline yet for this. So um, progress, but uh, certainly age 30 is not a primary word that we talk about in Europe in terms of guidelines. So thank you very much.